It's not bigger than Texas. It is Texas. Downtown Dallas, what the locals call the High Five. There's a strange, twisted beauty here. It's more than just a complex, multi-layered web of interconnecting freeways. It's a monument to America's energy paradox. In a car-dependent nation, dependent on others for fuel, the High Five loops and rolls out over some of the richest shale fields in the Lone Star State. And that means the new neighbour moving into the suburbs around here may well be a drilling rig. I know people who tried everything they possibly could and they still have drilling right next to their houses and they're very unhappy about it. You don't have to travel far to witness a collision between community and commerce, family and industry. We all take risks every day, driving to work, you know. But there's risks that you have to take and risks that you don't have to take. And to me, it just doesn't make sense to put a heavy industrial process right next to somebody's house. This is South Lake, a prosperous community on the outskirts of Dallas. A few years ago, Forbes magazine named this the most affluent neighbourhood in the United States. A place where usually money talks. But right now, the talk's all about the riches of the Barnett shale field underneath suburbs like South Lake, home to Dr Gordon Orland and his family. So there's so many things we don't know about this process. And that's really what became most frightening is the things that are being generated during the fracking process we know have the potential to cause harm. Things like uh, naphthene and benzene, which we know are linked to leukemia. We know are linked to cancers and other types of neurologic disorders. The emergency room doctor and his band of suburban activists often gather here at the local Mexican restaurant with their children to discuss the perils of a process they may not have even heard of a few years ago, even in oil-savvy Texas, fracking. And so this was where they were going to put it, yeah? Correct, yeah. Uh, just past that second fence line there. Um, would have been about 16, 1,700 feet from my front door and within about 1,100 feet of uh, some of my neighbours. <laughs> Neighbours like Diane Harris and her family. I'm not going to put a price tag on the health and safety and well-being of my family. There is no amount of money that will convince me that we should have this in the middle of our neighbourhoods. It's similar in my mind to how we found out about cigarette smoking and cancer. It wasn't that we did a study and found out, oh no, look, cigarettes cause cancer. It was 40, 50 years of, uh, of exposure. The process that so worries the doctor is hailed by the industry as the key to energy independence. The drill holes can go three kilometres down and then push out horizontally for kilometres as well. A cocktail of more than 500 chemicals, millions of litres of water and truckloads of sand is then used to break up the shale and release gas and oil. The process has transformed the energy business in a few short years. But the jury's out on its impact on the environment and people's health. Really, this is a new frontier. Nobody's done this. Nobody's done drilling in an urban setting and studied the long-term effects of what's going to happen. And so, uh, again, it comes back to my health, clean air, clean water. Um, those are things that we can't live without. We can all live without gas royalties. You know, a few dollars to have an industrial, toxic, chemical-laden facility literally in your backyards, it's not worth it. The risks are not worth the reward. I knew that if I didn't act, and if gas drilling occurred near my home and one of my children got sick, I would never forgive myself. The method of gas drilling they use is called hydraulic fracturing or fracking. 
As many South Lakers school themselves up on the fracking process, this documentary has been proving popular at the local blockbuster. It's called Gasland, and this is its most famous scene. Whoa, Jesus Christ. So I went out west and found people who could light their water on fire, many, many families. That smell hair. Oh, damn. And people started to realize, oh, my water's turning black, my water's bubbling, something smells funny, my kids are getting sick. They're all comparing information. Um, and then they discover, lo and behold, that they can light their water on fire right out of the tap. Jesus Christ. Josh Fox is the Gasland guru. It's really upsetting, actually. Yeah. It's hard to overestimate the impact of his heartfelt, homespun, yet very powerful documentary. Josh Fox has become the anti-fracking pin-up. That doesn't look very delicious. An inspiration for those fighting big oil and a serious challenge to the industry. There is a system here that is corrupt. Oil and gas pushes people around. It's bullying. It's aggressive. It gets its way. It's about time we're done with that way of doing business, with the culture of that because it's literally toxic in every aspect. It's toxic to the environment, and it's toxic to our political process. Here in Texas, there used to big oil. For generations, oil and cattle have forged the formidable Texas character. If you say Fort Worth and you talk about the energy business, you need to say XTO. XTO Energy. 25 years in North Texas. And they're now a subsidiary of ExxonMobil. And here, not far from Southlake, at the Fort Worth Stock Show and Rodeo, the crowd loves their cowboys and the big oil operators that bring jobs and prosperity. One of the leading producers of natural gas in the United States, 1,300 employees in North Texas, and they take care of our kids. God bless XTO. Thanks a bunch. Yeah, buddy, yeah, buddy. But the pace of the fracking frenzy makes a wild bucking bronco seem sedate. In just a few years, drilling rigs have sprouted up through the Texas suburbs like towering hills hoists, across from shopping centres, close to schools. Otherwise, residential neighbourhoods have become industrial zones. When the fracking starts, trucks gather round the well. The sand, water and chemical mix is pushed deep underground at extremely high pressure. Escaping vapour drifts in the wind. It's pretty dangerous. I see a lot of injuries. I've seen, uh, I've seen somebody actually get blown all the way back from a blowout. I've seen one guy die on a blowout. Dangerous, even deadly, but lucrative. Fracking is now underway in 34 states in the US. And urban cowboy Taylor Hinkle is just one of those cashing in on the new energy boom on a Fort Worth rig. Friday, man, it's, it's payday. So it's payday. It's great money. Like I said, it is a lifestyle. Once you decide to do it, once you get in full force with it, you ain't got a choice but to follow it around because you don't know nothing else. When I was younger, I always said it never happened to me, but once you get a taste of that money, it's addicting. Taylor Hinkle is working on a drilling rig just a few miles from the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. And just a stone's throw from new housing developments. Any kind of leaks or anything like that are a big hazard, especially out at the airport. If there was a problem on this location, if say somebody like sparked a lighter in the wrong place or you know, like a spark was, a, was discharged from like a piece of equipment, you know, if this well was to blow up, who's to say that that gas is not going to ignite underneath the ground and blow 20 different ones up around the airport? And that's the rub. There's a lot about what's happening under there that has people worried. And has the oil companies on the defensive. 
Certainly the API's best practices and operational standards that we encourage industry to use are very important in how industry goes about doing its business to make sure that they are operating safely, environmentally sound, and, and respectful of the neighbors and the stakeholders. So there are lots of things that go into these standards that I think address a lot of the issues that people have been raising. It's literally like a chemistry detective novel. One of the issues is chemical injection. The other issue is simply connecting the layers between these zones, which are toxic to groundwater, very far under the ground, where you have uh, gas, oil, uh, volatile organic compounds, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, um, normally occurring radioactive material. And what you've just done is you've created a connecting straw between layers that nature separated out millions of years ago with the groundwater. The fracking process was invented by Halliburton, a company later run by Dick Cheney for some years before he became George W. Bush's vice president. In 2005, the Bush administration passed an act exempting fracking from the Safe Drinking Water Act. That means they don't have to apply for a permit for chemical injection. And you're creating a highway of gas and oil that's going through the, the aquifer protected by a one-inch cement casing. And you ask the industry, do casings fail? And they say, of course. 50% of them fail over the life of the well. 50% of them fail over the life of the well. Which means that in 20, 30 years, you've got water contamination situation that's potentially catastrophic. It has definitely divided the town. It has not brought harmony to South Lake, let's put it that way. In South Lake, the fracking furor has provoked argument and insult. There's just something about this town that's called not in my backyard, you know? If I can't have it, you can't have it either. A lot of that is happening. It's not just the people in South Lake. Americans are just afraid of their shadows. The suburb is split between angry opponents and fervent supporters like, oddly enough, lifelong Democrat Zena Rucker. When I first became Democratic precinct chair for this district, everybody in this town was a Democrat. And uh, little by little, as the yuppies, then the dot-commers came into town, um, we used to say they get a little money in their pocket and um, they change. Zena Rucker is one of the original landholders here. And this is my backyard. <laughs> she considers herself a dedicated environmentalist. I love my backyard. And a conscientious conserver. I'm a true environmentalist. <laughs> I drive a Prius. I never take anything to the garbage. It either gets in the compost or it gets recycled. She owns 75 acres, pretty countryside that's worth a bomb on paper. A while ago, gas companies approached her with offers for the mineral rights on the property. There's my hanger and my windsock. The checks were too big to resist, even for a Prius driver. There was one that was pretty close to 300,000, the last one. I cashed some of them already, but um, uh, the leases ran out. So um, anyway, this last one, however, they took back and decided that they just weren't going to do it. But they led me to believe that had they drilled, I could easily make 30000 a month. But her bonanzas hit a wall. The local council has now sided with the fracking opponents and imposed a moratorium on development. If there's a gas leak and they're doing a barbecue or they're smoking. For the moment, Gordon Orland and his supporters have won out. My daughter is still in a developmental phase, right? She's four years old, and no one can tell me what the long-term effects on things like hormone production and ovaries and whatnot. You can't protect yourself from something you can't see and you can't smell. But while suburbs battle with worrying new residents, the frackers are descending upon a vast swathe of North America, and in one case, almost an entire state. the remote, sweeping plains and rugged rural landscapes of North Dakota. It's pretty inhospitable country, particularly in the grip of a freezing winter when we arrive. 
Not so long ago, North Dakota was struggling to keep its population. But that, as they say, is so yesterday. With the way things are going on the oil fields right now, it's just mayhem. This is where the work is. It's big. These roads are not made for this kind of traffic. The amount of trucks that are around here, uh, you could only explain it like flies around a cow shit. They're just trucks everywhere. Mike Keane's got the pedal to the metal and the icy road to the low grey horizon ahead might as well be paved with gold. The average driver on a normal week would probably make somewhere between four and seven thousand dollars a week. Just a driver. From the grocery stores, to the parts stores, to the hardware stores, to the truck drivers, everybody is doing well. And if they tell you they're not doing well, they're either not very good business people or they're lying. It's, it's a simple fact, they're not up here for anything other than the almighty dollar. Like millions before him, Mike Keane came to America from Ireland. In the 20 years he's been in the US, he's been a fisherman, a farmer and a horse breeder. Now he's a trucking magnate in the making, hauling water to the fracking rigs. I'm doing good. I'm doing real good. I now have five trucks, five trailers, all paid for. There are weeks here that I could uh, make in excess of 50000 for my truck in one week. The harder you work, the more you make. There's more oil than we can get out right now. You know, I'm not privy to what's happening in Saudi Arabia or uh, off the coast or up in Alaska, but this is a big play that's here for a long time. It, as long as the need's there and as long as the price stays where it's gonna be, this looks real strong. Nowhere is fueling America's dreams of energy independence more than this place, the shale-rich plains of North Dakota. Just the oil that's here could help transform the world's biggest oil consumer into the world's biggest oil producer. Boom is an adequate description, a boom beyond, I think it's safe to say, anything that anybody has really seen in this country since probably the land rushes uh, in, in the early 1900s. This is Watford City. A year and a half ago, that in itself was a misnomer. This little town of just over a thousand people was following much of the rest of the state into a long, slow decline. But in just 18 months, the population has grown from a little over a thousand to six and a half thousand people. There was a time Gene Vida knew everyone in town. He grew up here. Now the shops on Main Street are full of strangers. And for the head of this county's development authority, that's progress to be proud of. So now we're frantically trying to get housing for those people. You're in an area that hasn't really built much for the last 20 or 25 years. Right now, the challenges in this community are to get water and sewer in so that uh, developers can build more permanent housing. In a country where unemployment still hovers over 8%, North Dakota's jobless rate of 3% is the envy of the nation. Here in the shale oil belt, in towns like Watford City and Williston, jobs go begging. Walmart, McDonald's and even a local casino are among the many touting for workers. For those lured by the luster of the oil boom, finding somewhere to sleep can be harder than finding a job. The lucky ones end up here in hastily erected prefab man camps. A bunk and full board in a shared dorm room costs as much as $140 a night. No one's complaining. 
I'm a fracker. I work for a fracking crew. All we do basically is just pump water, gel, chemicals, and sand down a hole, and it helps well produce oil more efficiently. Last year, I, I grossed about $85,000, and then this year, I should gross a lot more. Others not so lucky sleep where they can. Car parks are overflowing with mobile homes and caravans. Truck drivers sleep in their truck cabs, if they sleep much at all. You won't be surprised to know that just like suburban South Lake, Texas, not everyone's happy. Yeah, last winter one day, my husband came back here and found this open spot that should be frozen over. And then we discovered all this water bubbling. And how cold does it get here? Oh, gosh, 30 below here last week. 30 below? Yeah. And this will still be like this? Yeah. Wow. Jackie Schilke says her previously pristine spring-fed creek started to bubble just a month after fracking on a neighbouring property. And actually, when I bought this property, well, it was six years this spring now, we were drinking out of this creek. Wow, really? It was so clear. <laughs> you wouldn't drink it now, would you? Oh, God, no. I <laughs> won't even walk in it, let alone drink it. Yeah, yeah my daddy told me, he goes, well, kind of tastes a little beavery, but it's good clean water, <laughs> you know? But there's a beaver dam down the way there. The beavers have all moved out. There you go. Jackie Schilke blames fracking for the loss of five cows, two dogs, and a number of chickens and for the decline of her own health. I was actually diagnosed with hydrocarbon exposure. I've got a lot of problems that come along with it. Well, when you live 24 miles out in the middle of nowhere, that shouldn't be a problem. I should be breathing the cleanest air in the world. Oh, darn you, girl. The industry admits its record isn't perfect, but says safety standards are improving all the time and those who have been adversely impacted do have options. There's always issues. There's nothing that we do in any industry and energy is not unique that's completely risk-free. You have the ability to go to your state regulators and raise issues and concerns as private landowners, depending on uh, which state you're in and what the state laws are, you may have recourse in the legal system. So th there are lots of ways that, that you can seek relief on that. They're goddamn liars. They're here to rape this land, make as much money as they can, and get the hell out of here. They could give a crap less what they're doing here. They will come on your property, look you straight in the eye, and lie to you. And they will leave without a second thought, and they do not care. From North Dakota to Texas, and a slew of states in between, Many now blame fracking for a range of ailments. Headaches, nausea, dizziness, skin rashes, and worse. When they came into my neighborhood, I began having a lot of intense, long-term headaches and extreme fatigue and dizziness. And now I've been diagnosed with anemia. Out of the, I never had anemia. Jane Lynn lives in Arlington, Texas a middle-class suburb just a few miles from South Lake. The fracking activity here in the past two years has been feverish. This has been like, I guess, my worst nightmare. It's like a bad dream and I keep thinking, OK, I'm going to wake up and it's, it's going to be back to normal and it, it, it's not. And it's, uh, it's really sad. Compressed natural gas... Tonight at the Arlington City Hall, Jane Lynn is one of a growing group of concerned residents hoping to block proposals for more wells in the neighbourhood. These drilling rigs are marvellously engineered pieces of equipment. The place is packed and it quickly becomes apparent not everyone is on her side. It's a good thing for everybody. These days it seems like the tail wags the dog and uh, I think it's time for the dog to stop that. Thank you. Here too, money, development and perceptions of the national interest are dividing the residents. Thank you. Tonight, Jane Lynn and her activist friends won and lost. Council voted against one well site proposal, but approved another. 
everyone was so pro-drilling and this is the red, white, and blue American thing to do. And um, I just never saw it that way. And I was being personally affected by it. But now I'm seeing other people rise up who are feeling the same way. I think a lot of people now would like a do-over. In this car-crazy nation, with its reliance on prickly, often hostile and unstable Middle Eastern suppliers, it's easy to see why the new energy rush within has gathered such momentum. But where it collides with the American heartland of family and future, and where it threatens wildlife and a way of life in America's vast backyard, fracking is fast becoming a very dirty word. Like the process itself, the fractures and fault lines are exploding. Mm -hmm. 